Thank you. Folks, take your seats. Um, this penultimate panel is the threats from authoritarianism and corruption and kleptocracy. And moderating this is a longtime friend and one of the leading activists and advocates on this issue, Charles Davidson. Charles, over to you. All right, thank you, David. And, and thank you, David and Nino and um, Evelyn for inviting me. And uh, this has been an extraordinary conference, I think. And uh, as far as conferences go, one might say it's timely, which isn't always the case. Uh, before we start, and before I introduce everyone, I'd just like to say, uh, in relation to the previous panel, which was so moving, in terms of our topic, Vladimir Karamuza used to repeatedly say in his op-eds in the Washington Post and in just about every event where I heard him speak, when asked what can the West do to help Russia, he would reply, stop enabling the corruption. Mm -hmm. We heard him say that many, many times. So anyway, as David said, I'm Char Charles Davidson. Uh, we have a a uh, wonderful panel here coming at the subject from all sorts of different directions, including a criminologist, a tenured criminologist. So he can, of course, say what he really thinks. Uh, not Kremlinology, criminology. Just Crimi yes, say. not Kremlinology. <laughs> Although there are many criminals in the Kremlin too. Criminology, yes. So, Besiki Kutateladze. Is that close? Excellent. The last name? Okay. Is with us. We have Marta Ruda from ANTAC, arguably the leading anti-corruption NGO of the Maidan generation in Ukraine. And on your programs, of course, it says Daria Kalinyuk. We merely need to imagine that Marta is Daria. Uh, to my right, then, we have Ben Judah, who uh, published, his first book was published about Russia, Fragile Empire, when he was 23 years old. So he's a Russia guy, and then he's also very much an anti-kleptocracy corruption guy, as many of you may know from his writings. And he's a well-known journalist uh, who has written in popular magazines too, so he's someone with, uh, who plays all the keys of the piano. Uh, from Transparency International Georgia, we have Eka Kigauri, whom I've uh, met at, uh, at previous conferences here and who really knows what's going on in Georgia. And of course, since she is from Transparency International, which I think we all know by reputation, the topic of this panel is somewhat appropriate to what she has been doing over the years. Uh, now, but, but before we start also, the title of this uh, panel, uh, which mentions authoritarianism and corruption and kleptocracy, modern day authoritarianism, when we look at it, all the current authoritarian regimes, I would argue, incorporate corruption and kleptocracies. There is no authoritarian regime that is not corrupt and kleptocratic. So, in fact, we're going to leave aside the issue of authoritarianism and just talk about corruption and kleptocracy. Um, and uh, so, so we're going to start, actually, with what might be considered an overture to the opera with our tenured criminologist, uh, because uh, I've always heard over the years from people, oh, you know, you can't do anything about this because you have this opaque offshore financial system and you, can, you, you may catch one or two people, but you can't possibly roll it up. Well, criminology has something to say about that. And, Besiki, please. Sure, absolutely. Uhur Besim Adloh please. Um, so in criminology, and I don't want to be lecturing here because I do this for a living elsewhere, um, we believe in deterrence, very much like in the political science. We believe in both specific deterrence, which is to warn individuals not to commit new crimes, otherwise their punishment will be even harsher, 
and would you believe in general deterrence also to send the message to others not to think uh, twice about committing the crimes. So if it didn't exist in criminology, the criminal justice system would not have functioned. So for all the centuries, we have embraced this notion. But that's not a perfect notion. I personally also believe in incapacitation. And when it comes to the ideas of fighting corruption, uh, fighting white-collar crimes, money laundering, I do believe in incapacitation approach also. Um, we need to be realistic. While we believe in deterrence, we also be, need to be realistic that kleptocrats are very smart, extremely well-connected, and the idea of the kleptocracy is a very transnational, dynamic form of corruption. So the siloed approach will not work. We need the partnerships, both in the United States, within the Ukraine, Eastern Europe, but also international partnerships. But also the approaches that may be working today certainly will not work tomorrow, because people tend to reinvent themselves, especially when they're rich, when they're connected. And that is true about any good thief, any good criminal. Good criminal is a criminal who is one step ahead of law enforcement. And I think people who are corrupt and the benefits of the corruption are, uh, are so vast for themselves and the families, they will find their ways around. That's why we need to invest into our law enforcement. And instead of maybe spending all of our I'm going to talk a lot about prosecution because that's what I do. I do in the United States that I'm involved in the prosecutorial reform very actively. So instead of spending all our resources on prosecuting low-level crimes, I think it's important that the law enforcement agencies learn how to prioritize bigger, more consequential cases with greater return for the public safety, for community health and well-being. So those things are important to consider. Ter terrific. And we'll come back later to judicial issues specifically regarding Ukraine. But we just wanted to open with this, which is a rather optimistic note. Uh, now, our topic, Ukraine. So um, Marta is going to lead us into various issues concerning corruption kleptocracy in Ukraine and the work of her organization, Antec. Yeah, thank you very much. And as Ukrainian, I'm very grateful for Georgia for hosting uh, this conference and actually devoting it to uh, Ukraine and uh, for the slogan Slava Ukraini and through this I feel support and uh, Ukrainians feel support of many Georgians uh, and actually yes I represent uh, anti-corruption NGO uh, which for a decade actually has been advocating for effective anti-corruption institutions uh, and together with uh, others, we were quite successful, I would say. Uh, we've created the whole system, parallel system of fighting top corruption, uh, investigative body, prosecution body, and anti-corruption court. Uh, because uh, we understand, and actually I agree with uh, Basiki, Basiki. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, that uh, you have to prioritize, and we as uh, ANTAC, we understood that there is a proverb that uh, fish is rotting from the head, so that's why you have to clear the head uh, first, and then petty corruption will decrease for sure. Uh, and also judicial reform is another important sphere which we are uh, advocating uh, for cleansing, uh, and also quite successfully. Uh, and coming closer to the war, uh, we were surprised actually by Vladimir Putin's uh, speech on the 20th of February, where he mentioned all Ukrainian effective anti-corruption reform, including the way we uh, chose uh, judicial governance bodies. It means that uh, uh, democratic transformation, anti-corruption uh, transformation of Ukraine was a really a uh, threat for Russia. And this was one of the reasons, actually, uh, as we see, uh, for uh, punishing us <laughs> for uh, going forward uh, and uh, going, actually, uh, apart from authoritar authoritarianism and actually, uh, and also Putin's regime. Um, and that's why we um, actually understand it also as a global um, threat and global issue not only for Ukraine because many countries and including Georgia uh, are trying to uh, go this path and path of democratization um, and 
to my mind, as I see this tendency, first, uh, Russia is creating internal conflict, so to say, in some territory and cr calling it uh, like national one, like uh, there is one in Georgia and also in Ukraine, we had uh, 2014 war. And then if a country is still resisting it, still uh, successful on the way to democratic transformation, uh, there is no other chance actually to defeat it only like through military aggression. And unfortunately, we cannot uh, fight it back with another means other than arms. Uh, and that's why our anti-corruption organization recently, we uh, actually after the start of the war, we put a lot of efforts on advocacy of uh, enough arms to Ukraine to defeat the country, its people, but, only, but also actually democratic order and things which we were like fighting and building together with uh, other partners and actually international donors and where we were also in some uh, trends, like setters and example uh, to other countries which uh, also can follow this path. And if we uh, will lose, it's not an option, like neither for us or for the world. That's why uh, this is the only uh, way forward. Uh, and uh, this is actually the, one of the, our key uh, messages and key uh, aims of our organization. And, uh, so can, can yeah. you just very briefly tell us how has the war affected the work of ANTAC and other anti-corruption organizations in Ukraine? Just very briefly, because in what ways have you had to switch gears, adapt? How is anti-corruption positioned now in the current, in the current situation? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I would say that the work of whole of our society uh, NGOs and anti-corruption bodies, uh, they were quite similar, uh, this tendency, because part of uh, both our experts and workers and also prosecutors, <laughs> they went to, uh, to the military actually and they went to defend our country. Uh, and also uh, another part, we try to use our expertise in uh, bringing the victory closer. For example, uh, uh, if you had good analysts who uh, used to look for some like cor corrupted schemes, uh, who knew how to use like foreign databases and so on, they uh, used their skills to uh, fi find people who had to be sanctioned. Uh, if uh, like our communication experts, they use their skills, connections, and knowledges to uh, to fight back actually in information war. Uh, lawyers to um, international advocacy. Uh, uh, we actually, together with uh, other Ukrainian NGOs and uh, mostly women, like only women, uh, we created International Center for Ukrainian Victory in Warsaw. Uh, few uh, women who, like uh, heads of the Ukrainian NGOs, who fled together with small children, especially, and it became quite imp quite important international advocacy, like center, and uh, also where where we could cooperate and. But a good example, actually, of cooperation mm. of Ukrainian civil society. Mm. So we are fighting on this international advocacy mm. uh, field in order to bring sanctions, to bring more military support, to bring uh, responsibility for war crimes, to, to de actually to develop new international mechanisms as well, uh, because uh, unfortunately some, some are not working. <laughs> right, so you feel as though you're an integral part of the war effort, yes or no? Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eka, corruption, kleptocracy, Georgia, Georgia's situation. If you could uh, talk about that, please. Um, and also, how does the Ukraine war affect Georgia's challenges with this issue? Well, um, uh, I would say that uh, Georgia is uh, in the unique situation here because. Uh, for many years, um, Georgian anti-corruption reforms were um, like very popular. I would say we managed to eradicate corruption in several months even. And this is a good example how successful the government could be when there is a political will to fight corruption mm -hmm. inside the country. Um, and definitely we were in the position, and also this anti-corruption reforms, what was this for Georgia? At the same time, we wanted to show to the whole world that um, if uh, the government is ready to build the uh, uh, independent institutions, uh, 
uh, fight the corruption so it can be successful and it also can um, show to the neighboring countries like you know, Russia that uh, with this we can be resistant to the Russian influence and really show to the post-Soviet world that uh, the country which focuses on the democratic reforms, uh, on anti-corruption reforms, um, they can survive without even having good relations with Russia because that was actually the message of Russians for many years that you can survive only by being close to us. But then we said no, you know, we have our own past, we want to change this country and this is the will of the people, this is the will of the, uh, of the government and we did this. Uh, so at this moment, apparently, uh, we, we have managed to maintain um, the, um, the, the, the fact that we don't have the petty corruption. But, but at the same time, we still face challenges when it comes to the grand corruption. And definitely I can say that because uh, we still um, did not focus enough to build the, like, you know, or this time that we had, you know, was not enough to build the really, really strong institutions. So that was, and the checks and balances system, this is the main thing here, because without having the proper checks and balances system, you might not have the petty corruption, but we, you will have the grand corruption, and this will be the main challenge for, 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 uh, for the country. So, what we have now, we have uh, problems with the grand corruption. We apparently facing um, how the state is captured in this country. And this is the reality, and more and more we, we see that it's happening. And this is unfortunate reality, I should say. So, yeah, uh, we don't have the proper checks and balances system in Georgia. The uh, ruling party does everything to maintain in power. We have the elections, but during the elections, the ruling party abuses the state administrative resources. We see the sign of kleptocracy here as well, because um, all the groups which uh, can resist to the corruption and to the kleptocracy, actually, they are very weak. And apparently the government uses this um, kind of technique to divide and rule. This is what is happening here, that the groups, the civil society, the, uh, the, um, the opposition parties, the institutions are very weak, so our system cannot resist to kleptocracy and to the grand corruption threats in this country. Um, we uh, see also that, uh, uh, that, yeah, again, the civil society is under the attack, especially the watchdog organizations, those who speak um, about the problems in this country. We see that the opposition is under the, the many opposition leaders are under the investigation, and again, because the system is abused, because the law enforcement agencies are abused, and apparently we still to speak about the uh, politically, politically motivated investigations in this country. Uh, we have uh, the Klanin judiciary, which again is backed by the ruling party, which actually again helps the ruling party to punish those who are resisting to the corruption, who are uh, like fighting against the corruption and the abuse of power. Um, and definitely we look that, uh, we see that the, uh, the critical media is under the attack. Um, and now apparently we are in the situation when the uh, director of one uh, critical media outlet is in the, in the prison for really nothing. So this is the reality that we see. We, we are not happy about this apparently because um, we all talked about this window of opportunity that Ukraine gave us that because of the war in Ukraine, now Georgians also have the chance to be closer to EU, to like really uh, become the member of the EU, but because of this situation that we have here, because the state is captured, because every, everything that happens here is in the hands, mostly in the hands of, uh, uh, of the uh, ruling party, we have the concerns that uh, we might not get there. 
So, um, um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is again the unfortunate reality that we, that we see. So, and uh, we have many discussions in this country, what, where is the solution? Definitely solution rests with the people. Definitely people who once said that we don't want the corruption here, we don't want to, like, you know, for the particular groups to abuse the power, we don't want to, like, you know, for the regular people to suffer from the corruption, so we achieved that. We, we show to the whole world that, that we can achieve this, but now, again, we need for people to understand how important it is to resist to the corrupt regimes, to resist to the kleptocracy in this country, and to resist to the state capture in this country. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, <clears throat> uh, ben, do you have anything to say about all this? Well, I just wanted to say it's uh, always going to be hard to follow such sort of strong and eloquent voices from the region and from the academy, and it's a real honor to be on this, this panel. But I wanted to bring, begin my remarks by talking also about a little bit about the work of the moderator, which is when Charles like, began and pioneered this crusade against kleptocracy in Washington, Paul Manafort was at large on K Street. The, some of the worst oligarchs now under the sanctions list were being courted and fated in Calorama, and it's important to acknowledge that we have come a long way since then. You know, if we look at where we are now, there has been progress. There's an anti-kleptocracy strategy. There's an anti-kleptocracy caucus in um, the House. There are major sanctions placed on these kleptocratic figures uh, that have been sort of menacing uh, the, the West. But we shouldn't confuse this progress, some progress, or even significant progress, for sufficient progress. We have laid foundations. We have not built a wall against this threat. We come to acknowledge it, but we still aren't taking it seriously. So what are the three ways that we, in Washington, in Brussels, in London, are not taking it seriously? There are three points I wanted to go for. The first is we are trying to do this on the cheap. We do not have the staff allocated to this. We do not have, therefore, the capacity to go after these problems. If you don't have the staff, you don't have the information. If you don't have the information, you don't have the prosecutions. We simply cannot, when it comes to this problem, attempt to solve a complicated problem, a really threatening one of 2022 with a staffing level of 1995. And just to put it in more uh, stark terms, there are more people dealing with litter in Crown Heights in New York than there are dealing with this hugely dangerous problem that we face. And the second problem we face is we're not doing it in a joined-up way. The UK, the EU, and the United States simply have not managed to coordinate their anti-kleptocracy policies in order a way to close those gaps that Putin and his cronies can get through. There are regulatory asymmetries. Some laws in the UK, some laws in the US, some laws in the EU, they don't all join up. They offer ways for kleptocrats to get through. There are gaps within the EU. The EU does not have a functioning single anti-money laundering agency. There are huge disparities of responsibility, of where problems are supposed to be uh, solved, and these are all offering gaps for kleptocrats to uh, go, uh, go through. And there hasn't been an effort to really try and create a central anti-corruption body to address some of the legal problems that, we, that exist currently. Right now, there are legal obstacles that make it very hard for an investigator in Florida to get information from an investigator in London to solve a case that might be here in, in Georgia. It's simply been viewed as not a priority or too hard to try and deal with, with these, these kind of uh, problems. So this brings us to the third point, and this is what I really want us to kind of take home here, which is the danger of zombie, uh, the, the danger of a hologram anti-kleptocracy front. So the worst hologram anti-kleptocracy effort is probably the United Kingdom. In my country, you 
can see, if you open the books, the laws are there. If you look at the government statements, the statements are, are there. If you look at the teams, well, the teams exist, but because none of them are staffed, none of them have capacity, and none of them can therefore achieve any prosecutions, it's a hologram. It looks like it's real, but then when you get close, you can put your hand through it. And as long as you can put your hand through it, Putin and his corrupt forces can uh, go right uh, through that. So I want to kind of end with, I think, the key point in which all of these kind of voices uh, from the region and from the academy, and of course Charles has been saying for so long, which is anti-kleptocracy is geopolitics. It is very hard to capture for authoritarians the spirit the, and the mind of a society. And as we see in Georgia, it's a society that's continued to move away from uh, Putin's uh, vision of the, the world. But it is, unfortunately, very easy to capture oligarchs. What defends you in that situation? It's strong institutions. And you get strong institutions through strong anti-kleptocracy. And that's why anti-kleptocracy is geopolitics, and a geopolitics that's crucial to tie together all of the themes we've been discussing at this wonderful and important conference. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you. <clears throat> So, including and going beyond what Ben has just said, could we get Eka's perspective and then uh, Marta's also on uh, what your organizations and you think about what we can do to counter and vastly curtail the problem of corruption and kleptocracy in your countries? And of course, this isn't something confined on, on the national level, but if you could uh, comment on that, because I, I, I know both of your organizations have uh, a view of this, and what are the priorities? And how do you see the role of the West uh, in terms of what you confront in your countries? Shall we start with Eka? Uh, so I, I, I'll start with, uh, with Georgia, so I think that uh, uh, for Georgians, it's very important now to uh, to have to like you know to, for the donors to coordinate their activities or international community to coordinate their activities to like really back and assist those who are uh, resisting to the corruption. And this is definitely the civil society. We have very active civil society here. They try their best, they investigate, they are vocal, they try to inform people about the corruption risks and why it's important to end some particular cases of corruption. And uh, uh, definitely, it's, uh, these are, uh, as I said, these are uh, um, organizations uh, which are under the, and the individuals who, who are under the attack. So I think that we really need the visual, also the physical support, um, uh, and also the financial support in order to uh, make uh, the mm -hmm. work of this organization stronger. So then, of course, the, uh, the investigative media especially, and the media uh, as a whole, uh, we, the Georgian need, media needs the support. And we all understand that may, sometimes the media has problems with the quality. We understand that we, our media also needs the time to develop and to, to be on the like, you know, high level. But anyways, these are the groups who are like, really uh, resisting to, to kleptocracy and corruption in this country. Definitely, we need the, like the proper analysis of the situation here, yeah. you know, because sometimes we feel that um, even our friends, they don't really understand what's going on on the ground. And it's very important to know why some things happening here, because again, the kleptocrats are very, very smart you know, and they know how even to package their policies and their strategies and how make sure that our Western partners think that these initiatives are okay and right. good. But then, then it's very important to know right from the beginning what are the int intentions of those who want to maintain in power forever. And so that's why I think that this, uh, the right policies towards these um, uh, this people and the ruling party in our case, and uh, the right assessment of the situation will help. 
So as for the international uh, level, so I, I would uh, talk about the views also of Transparency International. Um, um, I think that uh, one thing is the cooperation and coordination. This is what, what uh, we, we talked about now, and this is, this is what is very important, because uh, we don't see this uh, kind of one-line policy. We don't see that. Uh, I think that we need the global cooperation, the data exchange, the, uh, the investigative bodies, co cooperation, and all this. This is very important. Second, the policy should be introduced very fast, because uh, the kleptocrats, they don't have this, like, you know, bureaucratic systems, you know, and they <laughs> can introduce and adopt any policies and strategies in like you know, one day time and we don't have time because the because the corruption became becomes uh, very complex and um, and like every day so well, we there, need the fast strategies fast decisions right. this is what we need the, yeah. and yeah. as we know they're advised by the best in the west which helps helps too yeah uh, can, can we move on to yeah. Ukraine and then we, we can, can always can come I back? Can I actually add yeah. two points before we move to Ukraine about Georgia? Because yeah. I've learned all excellent points, like I agree wholeheartedly. I've learned this week that the Georgian parliament is discussing the new law, new bill, about possibly electing the prosecutor general in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, immediately, obviously, it caught my attention, uh, which seems like a great idea, especially if it serves to bring the opposition and the governing party together around the negotiation table. But uh, we also need to be quite realistic, especially when it comes to fighting the kleptocracy. That without, it's a one piece of a bigger puzzle. And just in itself, just electing the prosecutor like it happens in the United States. By the way, in the US we have more than 2,300 local prosecutors elected every four years. So it's a political position. There is some independence associated with that. But there are tons of other challenges. If we have the time, we can talk about this at some point. Yeah. So it's a big puzzle. And uh, uh, I want to make sure that the civil society is at the table, not only outside talking about this issue, but if we want to reform the prosecutorial system, I think that countries like Georgia, Ukraine, others should consider forming a formal civil society governing board which oversees prosecutorial decision making. So the board can get together every month. We have precedents of this in the United States and other countries. We can learn from those experiences, review data, review statistics, pull certain cases. And if they think that some cases are politically motivated, they should have the veto power. The civil society should have that power, not only being outside and talking about this when no one is listening, but have the formal responsibility to oversee prosecutorial decision making. Mm -hmm. Can I make one other quick point? Very quickly, mm -hmm. Betty, because we're going to come back to this after. Okay, okay, so. well, why, don't, why don't you save that point for when we come back to judicial reform? Because I want to talk about because, the solutions. Uh, no, what? I oh, want yeah. to talk about the solutions. Well, no, with that, we're, we've, we've gotten to the solutions in our <laughs> agenda already. Don't, don't worry. And, and judicial reform is a huge issue in Ukraine, of course, is, is, and is talked about a lot. Uh, as, as we know, and we'll, we'll get to that. And Marta has uh, wanted to address that too. So let's, let's, we'll get there in just a few minutes. But first, let's hear Marta on um, uh, going back to what can we do about corruption and kleptocracy? And from your perspective, Ukraine, the work of ANTAC, what are the priorities? What do you see as the, uh, the key uh, things that can be done to vastly curtail this problem? What are the realistic priorities, not the, not the dreams, of course, and you can re you know, refer to some of the things Ben mentioned if you want to. Yeah, actually, uh, I agree and thanks to Benjamin uh, on uh, systematizing uh, existing problems, uh, which I totally agree, and uh, unfortunately, sanctions, uh, sanctions uh, mechanism and looking for uh, those people, they revealed a lot of problems actually in existing legislation and uh, it also uh, pushed, for example, even EU for much faster uh, legislative process and so on. And um, I agree that cooperation, data sharing uh, is really uh, what we see is lacking now in imposing effective uh, sanctions mechanisms. Uh, another big issue, and uh, this is uh, also a big political issue, but crucial for uh, fighting for Ukraine, actually, and for fighting uh, 
for Ukrainian victory at, and Russian corruption is uh, designating Russia as state sponsor of terrorism. Um, this will lead to a lot of actually uh, uh, things which will uh, help us to uh, fight this uh, corrupted money uh, in different actually uh, spheres and will not let uh, to influence uh, both like military and international politics and to launder this money. Um, so this is actually what West can do and what the West should do. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from uh, all this systemic, more uh, comprehensive work on uh, uh, anti-money laundering, which actually Ben uh, said. Uh, and in terms, uh, should we move to ju judicial reform? Because ju judicial reform has been a huge issue in Ukraine right now, and I know Antac's been involved with that. So, uh, what what can you tell us about uh, uh, about the uh, current situation? of the judiciary in terms of corruption kleptocracy and where are you uh, advocating for things to go? Um, yeah, and I also wanted to uh, uh, share this experience to get also to, with Georgia because Georgia for us uh, was an example <laughs> years before in fighting corruption and we were very inspired but by Georgian experience. Um, and uh, what can we share from our experience actually uh, in terms of fighting corruption in that you have to build a system. Uh, one element is not enough. Uh, for example, we had situations where we had a lot of transparency, good investigative journalism who revealed a lot of corruption, but for example, without prosecution, without investigation and judicial system, you cannot do anything. And if one of this uh, part of this puzzle is missing, corruption will uh, prevail and you cannot fight it. Mm -hmm. So actually, a Ukrainian example, and I uh, cannot pretend it's like universal, but uh, it was, we created parallel system of those bodies because we could not reform like a really huge system of police, prosecution and judicial system. But we understand that without reforming uh, like the whole judiciary, not only creating anti-corruption court, you cannot uh, like establish rule of law in the country. So um, in Ukraine, um, one of our like innovations was uh, uh, engaging international experts like people with very high integrity uh, we uh, engaged them to uh, selecting uh, high anti-corruption court uh, judges uh, and it worked out actually it worked out very good uh, though it's yeah it's hard to find those people to engage them to explain them the context so also the, they understand what what are the risks and what um, what is truth in this situation and uh, but apart from this this uh, recipe is working quite good and we used it for uh, cleansing uh, our high council of justice and uh, high qualification commission uh, just uh, before the start of the war like these bodies uh, were to start working uh, it was like stalled for a few months but now we are renewing this process actually and we hope Mm -hmm. We will <laughs> win in all senses. As, as do we. Besiki, when you hear this, what's your, what, what do you, uh, how do you assess the situation in, in Ukraine and, and uh, what, can they, uh, what can they do better? Well, you're saying you're inspired by Georgians. We're definitely inspired by the Ukrainians. The whole <laughs> world is. So, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert in Ukraine. Uh, during the Ukrainians uh, have developed uh, uh, specialized prosecutorial office to deal with corruption cases. We have models like that in the United States. I'm not sure that's fairly uh, effective, uh, but when you do not have the time to reform the bigger system, judiciary, existing prokuratura, Soviet prokuratura that is still ingrained into our blood so much, um, uh, th there is an option of creating that. I certainly think that that's not the way that uh, we should be thinking about right now. I think we should think about the reforming the entire prosecutorial system because you cannot reform the judiciary without reforming the prosecutorial system. And uh, uh, another aspect, in addition to engaging uh, much more formally the uh, civil society, we need to think about the dedicated task force that focuses on the kleptocracy cases. And the task force n does need to have the partnerships you, you were mentioning, Ben, we need to have the international partnerships because c countries like Georgia or Russia don't even have the capacity, like you were saying, to uh, have those groups together. We need experts on money laundering, foreign evidence gathering, asset forfeiture, 
you know, prosecution, investigation with data specialists. This is a serious investment that the countries have to make if they're serious about uh, tackling uh, a plutocracy. And mm -hmm. the West cannot leave places like Georgia, Ukraine, whatever they're lo you know, alone tackling this humongous problem. You know, let's not forget that the West has contributed to this problem or enabled this problem. You know, we know when the bankers, some of your friends in London and Wall Street have created those offshore accounts where all the money could have been shipped and managed remotely for those mafiosis or kleptocrats or, you know, tax evaders. Maybe intention was not there, but that has enabled the kleptocracy to flourish in places like Eastern Europe. So the West certainly has the responsibility, moral, financial, and otherwise, and has to provide resources to change this. And that can also imply creating additional laws, regulations, to eliminate safe heavens for kleptocrats to ship money, manage remotely, and just enjoy good lives and send their children to colleges in uh, London and New York. Fantastic, Viseki. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to go to the floor soon, if I'm right, uh, looking at the time. So we, uh, I'd like uh, uh, Ben to make a few comments before we do that in, in a minute. Ben, can you, without speaking quickly, because remember we can't speak too fast because of the simultaneous translation. Thank you. Um, I think it's very important now to think how can we link all of this thinking about anti-kleptocracy to actual pieces of politics happening now that will help Ukraine win the war, sustain European uh, support, and move it towards its goal, which is membership of the EU. And two ideas that we can go into more detail later, I think, are important. One is to create a Ukraine-EU reconstruction agency with European officials, and British and American, I would hope, too, on the board that administers contracts mm -hmm. where the aid goes in Ukraine. And that can demonstrate that you don't need to be worried about sustaining and increasing the money to Ukraine over the, the long term and shut down critics that are uh, voicing concerns about where certain things are going. And the second, and I might not be popular saying this, is to engage with Emmanuel Macron's idea of the European political community. It's being launched and discussed in Prague at the next European Council. And it offers another option for conditionality that can accelerate reforms. And we know that Ukraine has sprinted for reforms to get candidate status. This is an opportunity to sprint for uh, more reforms. And I think that we can try and see if we can include an anti-corruption element in his proposal. Wonderful. Well, uh, as, as we go to the floor, I'd just like to mention one thing in uh, uh, complimenting what uh, Eka said and uh, Biseki and Marta too, which is there is a very serious effort underway to create an international anti-corruption court. I don't know how many of you have heard about this. It's being headed up by Mark Wolf, who is a, a federal judge in Boston, and they've got an organization and it's uh, all sorts of prominent people are pushing for this, sort of modeled on the ICC, and uh, uh, it's act, yeah, Union Transparency International. <laughs> yeah, we, I think. we appreciate this for sure. We're advocating. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, people are increasingly thinking that this thing isn't completely crazy. Uh, lo and behold. So. Uh, are there any questions? If there aren't, we can, uh, of course, can continue to wind. Oh, I see a, uh, a French accent in the second row if we have a microphone. And I see another French accent in the fourth row. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I had a question for oh, Ben. Who, 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 who are you? Uh, I'm Laure Mendeville from the Figaro. So uh, I, I had a question for Ben. I was wondering whether uh, you know, um, the uh, long legs and long arms of uh, uh, Putin's kleptocracy in London grad had been just frozen or partly destroyed? And in which state is this, uh, you know, this, the situation legally and financially of the uh, riches of, uh, um, you know, Russian uh, oligarchy, Putinist oligarchy in your country? Thank you. 
The answer is partially destroyed, but you need to remember that there's not just the Putin kleptocracy that's been working through London and using it uh, to enrich and undermine its own societies. There are important coteries of kleptocrats from Africa, South Asia, and most importantly in London, the Middle East, which have been using the city uh, as a base to launder their society's wealth, undermining their own societies, which makes them a security threat uh, to the West. So it's really important that we try and go after the system and not just the uh, Russians if we don't want to open up future dangers uh, here. Can I, can I add on this? Mm -hmm, so please. also, um, you know, we, we speak about the banks and bankers and lobbyists and um, uh, real estate uh, agents and all, all these people who help kleptocrats to navigate the Western systems, right? But it's not enough. I mean, we should really think about the policies and how to punish these groups mm -hmm. because they are helping. They are helping these kleptocrats to live uh, nice life in the Western countries and to enjoy the life and they want the corrupt countries for their citizens but not for themselves. You know, their families are outside and they feel very well there. So that's why I think that we should really think about the proper policies, how to target these groups as well. Hmm. Right. Uh, French accent number two, and then I see some oh. non-French accents. So, sorry, but, but I think we have a concern. Uh, I'm Nicolas Tensa. I'm, uh, we have a concern with corruption, I think. Uh, just a follow-up, I mean, just a question, remarks that I put already uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, in Europe, uh, in France, and, but also in Germany, Italy, and many other countries, we have, I mean, basically the spread of Russian, I mean, pro-Russian peoples, pro-Russian nationals. Uh, just uh, uh, fueling, I mean, the, the, the Kremlin's uh, narrative, uh, endorsing this narrative. We see many of them in the TV shows, in the newspapers, etc. So there is a very strong suspicion of corruptions from, I mean, sometimes former member of the government, former member of the parliament, sometimes journalists. Uh, we really suspect that many of them may have received some bribes from the Kremlin, but also from China, Azerbaijan, because it's not only limited to, to Russia. So two questions. First question, who could we, uh, I mean, basically step in in our fight against domestic corruptions by foreign powers? I think it's absolutely crucial, not only tackled, not often tackled. Then there is a second point which is that in many countries, including mine, this kind of corruption is sometimes legal. It's sometimes legal. I mean, uh, we, we know also in Germany the case of uh, uh, Gerhard Schröder, etc. We know other cases, of course. Uh, it's not illegal to f work and to lobby for a foreign government. Mm -hmm. So what should be the efforts done uh, to make them illegal. I think that's a, absolutely a crucial point, and I would like to hear, I mean, yeah. the members of the panel about Great. that. Great. Okay, so much. I think that, that's terrific, and we'll address that. Uh, I, I would just make a, a preliminary comment. I guess I'm not really supposed to do this as moderator, but I think in this context, one thing to keep in mind is that people who have dedicated their careers to government often come out without much money. You know, they, don't, they, they don't have yachts and whatnot. And so it's not very expensive to buy people if they're in that situation and they're willing to sell themselves. So I think this is, we're not necessarily talking about large sums of money. We're talking often about small sums of money being very cleverly targeted and uh, uh, husbanded along, shall we say. So, that point of view, what, uh, this is a big question. Who would like to uh, uh, start responding to uh, Nicola? Oh, and I forgot to ask you to uh, introduce yourself. Nicola Tenzer uh, just spoke, and he is a leading French political analyst uh, and uh, uh, very, very well known in, uh, in France. So, what, um, uh, 
Uh, what reactions do we have to uh, to Nicola's point? Do you want do you want to uh, kick in Ben, and then I, I, then we need okay. to get uh, Ukraine also? Yeah. Uh, you go first. Okay. Oh, you, so, all right, um, okay, you can preempt. Yes. I mean, it's it's very interesting question. So apparently, it takes you to this definition of corruption as well, right? So like, you know, what's the corruption? Is the uh, uh, like you know the bribery? It's the state capture. It's like you know, grant corruption, kleptocracy, and strategic corruption, right? So when uh, when it is used, the corruption is used as a uh, geopolitical weapon to undermine the, the the sovereign state, right? So and in this, definitely, you need different actors, and definitely, these actors again helps you as a like you no know, country which uses the strategic corruption tools to navigate in the system and to reach your goal, right? So I think that um, we, again, every day we see that the new forms of corruption arise and we have to deal with this. And again, we should be very fast in our decisions and introducing the policies towards this. And uh, we should find a way how to, to challenge these groups as well which maybe act legally on the ground, but in a bigger picture, how are, are the tools in the strategic corruption? Yeah. Let's, do we, Marta or um, Basiki, anything no, before just, Ben? Uh, ben just Gilles, a little or? two sentences about this. I mean, law infor I mean, corruption is a law enforcement. It's political, but it's also the law enforcement problem. Prosecutors are dedicating 95% of their resources dealing with low-level crimes and reacting to things as opposed to investing into proactive investigative uh, capacity building. So those cases, I will never gonna be seeing the, uh, you know, uh, outside the, you know, the certain pockets because there is, no, there, is, there is no one in the offices to spend years, sometimes you know, even longer, to pursue those cases because that requires a lot of resources and in top prosecutors and investigators and international uh, partnerships and the political will within the countries to go after those cases. So unfortunately, if one of the ingredient, ingredients is not there, and in our case many ingredients are not there, we're not going to be successful. Right. Well, and, and then the, point, uh, the issue Nicola brought up, we don't even have the laws yet in some cases. We have to figure out how well, to, we have enough how to deal law. With the, with I think we have legally. enough laws to justify investigating corruption cases, white collar cases. I think there are enough laws if there is a capacity and the will to go after those individuals. And I don't think this is the legislative problem. I think it's an enforcement and a political problem. Yeah. Marta, anything on this? Yeah, I just also, uh, I think it's an important question and uh, it's an issue which is now very relevant in, because uh, Russia has a lot of resources and it's like influenced, influencing a lot of decisions by different ways and they are inventive uh, with financial things and uh, uh, there are like three points which I uh, can think of now. First is, as uh, Eka said, like some um, inventing and uh, uh, thinking about some legal policies. Uh, secondly, uh, it's like really um, effective anti-money laundering and transparency uh, of financial flows. Uh, because uh, when you see those flows and you can reveal it and you communicate it, it's like it's totally different situation when you uh, understand where you can block money and you can show where money goes and uh, to which source. Uh, and third one is a political action responsibility too, that societies have to uh, 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 not uh, accept it actually. It has to be unacceptable also on the societal level that uh, some politicians are not uh, like even ex-politicians here yeah, for whom it's like legal yet yeah, to be like somewhere uh, in uh, state uh, companies uh, that it's unacceptable and they have to understand that this policy is, in, is influenced by these politicians and they have to uh, voice their like uh, disagree with uh, these decisions. Too. Great. Thank you. Very quickly, Ben, because then we want to have time to take a couple more questions. Well, in the um, last panel, we heard that famous slogan, which is really a concept for our freedom and yours, the idea that the freedom of people in Europe and in repressed European societies is bound up ultimately with the freedom of the Russian people. And I'd like to add another concept, which is 
our corruption and yours, which is that the corruption of the Kremlin system is bound up with our own corruption. And the way that a lot of this money has found its target is through techniques, through a whole offshore finance world that was developed by our bankers and lawyers and accountants to hide the money of our elites. So many of these people have been bought in uh, Europe through all kinds of loopholes and techniques that allow our own domestic sources of corruption and influence to, to buy politicians. So we need to try and dismantle both at the same time if we're going to have any hope going forward, like with our hopes of freedom. Indeed. We have a, a couple of questions. I see uh, on the left, a number of rows there, one. And if you can just identify yourself and... Sure, thank you. My name is Sarah Clark, and I'm the uh, head of Article 19 Europe. Um, we work a lot on the issue of slaps, uh, so strategic litigation against journalists um, and other corruption watchdogs. Um, there's been a lot of focus on this in the UK because of, of those um, vexatious lawsuits that are taken by largely UK law firms um, against journalists investigating oligarchs, um, both from, from Russia and, and elsewhere. Um, I wanted to ask the panel whether the issue of um, strategic lawsuits um, has come up in Georgia and Ukraine. Are you facing these types of suits or are you being sued transnationally in London? Um, and I also wanted to sort of reach out to the rest of the audience here that we've, we've put through measures at the EU um, that are in draft form um, that would prevent the taking of slaps. Um, and we've done this also in the UK. However, we're seeing a lot of governments, including the French government, um, who aren't supporting these measures. Um, so we really need to see a lot more um, support from the UK, from, from France, um, from Germany, and, and from other governments who might be in the room. Um, please support uh, the anti-slap measures that we're trying to get through to protect watchdogs like those on the panel. Thank you. Right. Well, th this, this uh, the issue of anti-slap isn't really the, the subject of this panel, but I think we're all very plugged into it. If anybody makes to want a quick comment, we have to end here, actually. Oh, we can take one more question. Uh, I'll make one question about the reporters and the journalists, if, you, if, if I may, because... The uh, slap? Okay. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Just, just before you, you mention that, Bessie, I'd just like to say there's a big effort in the United States to pass federal anti-slap legislation and actually the Free Russia Foundation is involved in that effort and it's, it's quite far advanced. There's a bill that is under consideration and, and going through our sausage factory legislative process uh, right now. So we, we have something going on there. I don't uh, if it were the UK, Ben would comment, etc. But uh, Besiki, very quickly on that, and then we'll take a last question. No, I want to mention, just piggyback on that, you know, as an American, uh, Georgian-American, watching what's happening in the country through the lens of the Georgian reporters, I want to really take this moment and thank them, because they are not very much loved always, and they're doing their hardest job in the country uh, at the expense of their lives, their mental and physical health, and whether we like the reporting or not, sometimes they are the ones who are keeping the democracy alive in this country, and we need to find the ways how to support independent reporting as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, last question on the, the, the right. Lady with dark hair back there, thank you. Thank you. So, um, yesterday we had uh, some curious... Can you, can you identify yourself, ah, Katie please? Katie Hutschwili, Open Society Georgia Foundation. Yesterday <laughs> we heard some curious, uh, curious news that a group sponsored by Ukrainian anti-corruption agency has called for uh, sanctions on Bidzina Ivanishvili and about 11 persons pretty close to him, mostly relatives, because of having direct uh, communication and uh, co-work, as I guess, with Russian oligarchs. It's interesting for me, you as experts in this field, how do you see it as just a call, or do you see that it will have a serious follow-up, serious follow-up like a real investigation and potential sanctions, like 
something like has happened to Plachatniuk in Moldova. Thank you. Well, would anybody uh, like to touch? Would anybody like to touch that? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I think Katie knows my answer, but it was to the international experts, maybe. But uh, <laughs> okay, but I think that generally for our. Um, uh, ruler, the real ruler of this country, of course, it's problematic, I would say. And uh, I mean, he was not, uh, he's not only in this list, but the European Parliament mentioned uh, him, like, you know, saying that, talked about the possibility of his sanctioning, and definitely he faces problems uh, with his uh, money in the, in the Swiss bank. So um, I think, yes from the reputation point of view, and generally it's a problematic for him. Um, and um, apparently, if I would be in his shoes, I would think, like, you know, what I did wrong. So that's, that's my answer. <laughs> well, for the moment, I don't see that actually politically happening on the cards, but I do hear a rising conversation and rising questioning about it. And it's going to be very interesting to hear where that goes tied in, of course, to how things develop here. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening to us. <laughs> thank you very much. And a uh, big thanks to Charles.